Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your friendly neighborhood engineering, AI, and analytics consultancy. Yeah, it's time to talk about Databricks news for the month of October 2023. Now, I've done a few of these videos where I've gotten to the news roundup, and I've been scrabbling around going, okay, interesting stuff, but it's a quiet month. This is not one of those months. This month has a ton of things in there, anything from the massive move of all of your ML flow artifacts going into Unity Catalog. We have a new Deadwitch runtime, which does loads of really cool stuff that SQL people are going to be so happy about. It's just a ton of things that we need to talk about. And that's the plan. If you're new around here, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments which of these mad list of things you're actually super excited about. If any. And then, yeah, let's just go and have a look. So. As usual, I am in the Azure flavor of the release notes. So we're going to have a look at October 2023. We're going to go right down to the bottom and work our way up, just having a look about the things that we actually care about. So Unity Catalog volumes now available in uh, China. That's cool. If you're in a uh, China work, like a workspace and you've been trying to do it, volumes are this unstructured flat files that you can now register, a bit like mounting lakes that we used to do before Unity Catalog. You can now do that, but you don't have your tables in there. So it's for kind of landing areas and flat files, sandboxes, that kind of stuff. Now available in China. Uh, we've got a load of updates for the Databricks SDK. Now, that's the last time we're going to see that in these release notes. There's another section to the release notes that they've just added. It's called Developer Tools. We're going to see things like SDK and Terraform and that kind of stuff. All going in over there. But as usual, there's like 10 updates of them putting in lots and lots of SDK and Developer Tool updates. There was a huge rapid cadence there, which is great. Uh, some updates to the VS Code extension, allowing you to do some more stuff with custom Redwick URLs, which is cool. And then this is a fair biggie. So when we had Unity Catalog rolled out and we had our dev, test, and prod subscriptions, and we found out that we only, could only have one meta store, and we had to keep all of our different catalogs in the same meta store so I could see my dev data when I'm in prod, and that, I don't want that. So they brought out workspace catalog bindings. So I can say, okay, you as a user might have access to this catalog, but you're only allowed to access it from these workspaces, not those workspaces. That's pretty cool. This is an update to that saying, well, actually we can let people access the catalog, but only read only. So you could have your engineers populating a load of data in one workspace and then like analytics consumers spinning up and being able to get access to those catalogs, but not able to edit them regardless of their own user permissions from that given workspace. So read-only catalog bindings is a new thing that you can now go and have a play with, which is pretty cool. Run selected cells in a notebook. Being able to just highlight a few cells, like control, click, 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 and then just run my selected cells. Tiny UI update, but actually fairly huge and fairly cool, and will just mean you're no longer having to click somewhere and then hold shift and enter to try and do the right ones. Just click them, hit run. Nice, makes sense. I've uh, got some CLI updates. We've got some Partner Connect updates. That's more third-party tools being available, kind of just a little bit more automatically through the Partner, partner Connect portal. I've uh, got deletion vectors going generally available. Now, I did a vi video about um, deletion vectors recently. That is those little extra metadata pointers that go on a Parquet file to go, that record's deleted, that record's deleted. Rather than having to copy the entire amount of records that weren't deleted into a new Parquet file, it's just a massive speed boost optimization for that kind of stuff. Now GA. So if you watch that video and you want to go and have a play with it, you can now do that in production if you want to. Now, big thing that kind of spins off that, this predictive IO, this is something that was mentioned at the Data and AI Summit earlier this year saying, you know what, actually, we can just, we could just actually be a lot smarter about knowing you're about to do a merge. Well, let's just predict what we're going to have to do and just make things faster. Now, that is now something that is GA. You can go and have a play with that. Uh, there's a load of data around. I'll pop a link down in the description below. Um, and essentially, it's just going to speed up a load of workloads. Big, big thing you need to be aware of is it is good for serverless SQL, ProSQL warehouses. Again, that is on the Databricks SQL side of things. Or clusters running runtime 14 and above if you are Photon enabled. So you need to have the Photon engine if you want to be using predictive I.O. So do be aware of that as a limitation, not as a, limit, as a requirement. Um, but if you've got that and you turn on things like deletion vectors, you'll find just some of your workload just going way faster because it can just actually be a lot more intelligent about how it goes about 
building out your query plan about what it does with the files coming out about how much io actually needs to use huge 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 performance benefits you should see if you turn that on now there's going to be a higher cost if you're not using photon already and you turn photon on your cluster is going to cost more but then with this stuff you should see your jobs your loads just finishing way 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 quicker the argument being yes you pay more per minute of your cluster being turned on but you need fewer minutes because it's that much faster worth trying out so i'm not saying just throw away everything you've got and just turn that on and then you'll be great but for a lot of workloads a lot of really common etl merge kind of workloads turn on deletion vectors turn on predictive io and you should these things go pretty pretty darn fast now warning there mentioned it in the video we did about it but deletion vectors do upgrade the delta uh, protocol the delta reader and writer version of your delta tables so if you've got other third-party tools that's coming in and trying to query the delta it might not be compatible they might not have built that reader version in yet so if you do that do be a little bit cautious about it but if you can get away with it if you're doing everything inside databricks you're going to find massive speed improvements from doing turning that on which is pretty cool yeah, I said there's a few a few interesting things coming. Uh, some more updates to VS Code, which is cool. Developer tool release notes have moved, as I mentioned. Runtime 14.1 is GA. Now, that does have a load of stuff in there. We'll take a look at that at the end. Um, this is an interesting one. Photons now default. So if you just click new cluster, new cluster, yeah, 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 next, 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 next create, that is going to have Photon enabled. Photon used to be explicitly, you'd have to think about it and go, yes i want to tick that button yeah now automatically it's going to be ticked so if you're doing things that don't use the photon engine you're doing particular workloads that wouldn't actually natively take advantage of it you need to remember to turn that off if you're creating new clusters now if you're creating clusters using terraform or default scripts and automation which you should be for your big engineering jobs anyway that's not going to change it's not going to override anything it's just it's going to be default ticked if you click new in the ui you're going to see that um, you can now turn off the Databricks Assistant at the workspace level. It says enable. Technically, it's turn it off. So if you so at your Unity catalog level, at the account console, you could turn uh, the Assistant on for everything. And now you can selectively go, and now that one's not allowed to use it. So you'd still need to have enabled it up at your tenant or your organizational level, but you can now turn it on or off for individual workspaces. If there's people, like areas you don't want that turned on, areas you do want it turned on, you can now manage that. You've got a bit more fine-tuned control. Uh, semantic search. So if you're in Unity Catalog and you're looking for a table, you're looking for a given column of data, you're looking for something, you're searching. Uh, you can now actually be a lot more explicit, uh, a lot less explicit. <laughs> in that you can now use semantic search going, I want something that shows me, bah! and you can use natural language to try and query something, and it's going to be a lot better at actually returning results that are related to what you're talking about. Uh, previously, it was like, you know, if you're looking for profit and you typed in the amount of money I made, it would be like, I don't know, there's no the amount I money I made, money I made table. Now you can type in things like that and you'll go, well, you probably want the profit table, don't you? So your search, your ability to find data within Unity Catalog is a lot better. And if we're trying to say that this is actually something that, you know, analysts and business users would be using, it needs that kind of functionality. Now, it's still quite a serious data catalog. It's not really a super kind of business facing thing but it's just getting better and better at doing that kind of thing so great improvement uh we've got some more partner connect to monte carlo going and being associated um we can now set libraries in our compute policies so if we're building a, a cluster policy and saying okay so you're allowed to go and create your clusters but you're only allowed to use this type of machine and only this many of them and we're setting some of those policies we can now say you have to have this library as well so we can force the installation of certain libraries under our policy for people to turn things on. It's going to be as part of our policy, just defaulted, which is pretty cool. And again, a lot of people did that via init scripts, forcing init scripts as, as a global. You can now just put it in your compute policy, which is pretty cool. Models in Unity Cat is GA. We'll talk a bit more about that. We need to do a whole separate video about that. So if you were registering a model, so you'd gone through your MLflow experiments, you'd tried different variants and you said that is the machine learning model i want i'm going to register that and then use that and manage that as my live model that is now something that's saved into unity catalog and then you manage it just as part of your catalog so you can have access to that table you can have access to that table oh and you can use that machine learning model all through that catalog 
So that is a big, big change. Your model lifestyle has essentially all moved over to Unity Cat. There's a few other elements that are also going over that we'll see later on. Um, AI generated table comments. Now, I love this. You now have no excuse not to document your data model. I mean, you had no excuse previously, but you've got even less excuse now. So if I dive into Daily Bricks and I dive into my catalog, let me give it a second, uh, and then I grab some, some data, something I've not done this demo on before. Uh, I probably have done it in here, but let's see, fact sales already has a tag, product sales. No one's, no one's documented this data. So you can see I've got an AI suggested comment where it saw there was a table that no one's actually described, and it's had a look at what's in there, it's had a look at what columns are in there, and it's just essentially chat GPT'd a description of that table for me. I go, yes, thanks. I want you to describe that. So if someone goes and looks at that table, they've just got a decent documentation about what it is. That's pretty good. But I can also do it down at the column level. Now, I don't have a lot of columns in, in this example, but I can hit that auto-generate button, uh, and we see name of the product being sold, total sales amount for the product. Easy. That is now just something baked in, so I can go into any of my different tables, no matter how many columns I've got, and say, just generate my documentation for me. You have no excuse not to have a documented data model now. Now, I still need to look at it. I still have to read that and say, does that make sense? Has it correctly inferred what that column is? Does that actually make sense to my business users? But the fact that it just gives me that, it does 80% of the work for me, I just need to check it and validate it, is great. So now, everybody, please actually document your data model. You can do it now. It's been made so easy for you. There's no excuse. Okay, uh, another of our shift of the ML lifecycle going into Unity Catalog, feature tables are now inside Unity Cat, and that's called GA. So if you have any Delta table that has a primary key, you can now just make that a feature table, treat it like a feature table. So your feature store and your data model are just so much closer than they used to be. You do have to have defined a primary key constraint on that table, and then you can use it as a feature table, which is really cool. Again, we'll go through that as a separate video, but that is really, really good to see. Uh, another part of that is um, online feature computation. So if you are trying to do, like, uh, they, there's a few use cases, like looking at location, looking at the current state of something. So if it says, I want to I want to pass this to a model and infer the current I don't know, classification, whatever it happens to be, uh, but I also need some real-time context for whatever that is, I can define a Python function, also registered inside Unity Catalog, which is used for that online feature computation. That is now another thing that's baked in, which we'll take a deeper look at. But that's pretty cool. Other bits, uh, we've now got a new system table for compute. So we've got clusters and node types and how people are using clusters is now baked in as the system table. System tables are those nice views that we can set up, be populated with what tables are people querying, what lineage do I have, like lots of really interesting, just how are people using my Databrick platform being baked into these system tables, We've got new ones to do with clusters and what kind of machines they are and all that kind of stuff, which is really good. The other side, oh, we looked at predictive IO. We've now got predictive optimization. And now this is where if I want Databricks to automatically run a vacuum on my Delta tables, automatically run an optimize on my Delta tables, that is now baked in. Now, again, limitation, it'll only work with managed Unity catalog tables. Now, previously I avoided managed tables because I didn't see a reason to give the Hive Metastore that control over my data where if I deleted the table, I lost my data. So I always used external tables. But now this is an argument saying you should kind of be using managed Unity catalog tables. So if you do, you can turn on predictive optimization. Biggest thing for me is you can turn it on at the cluster level. So I can just, uh, sorry, at the catalog level. So I can say for my, this entire catalog, enable predictive optimization, then any managed Unity catalog table would just automatically get vacuumed and optimized. Which is really cool and saves you a job and saves you having some notebook that loops around all your tables running those commands manually. Uh, so that is really good. Um, so again, you can take a look at it. I'll put a link down into the docs, but pretty, pretty cool. Right, more, we have more things. Um, there's some improvements around uh, Unity Catalog volumes. There's a limitation about whether, whether the volume could be behind a firewall and private link. That's now been sorted out, so it's a little bit nicer to work and have things if they're secure, which is good. Uh, there's a new Azure region that you can use Databricks in, which is uh, the Qatar Central. Um, 
Dedivix Auto ML notebooks now saved as ML Flow artifacts. It's just a slight change to actually what those outputs are where they're now baked in a little bit better. Uh, Daily Raikou coming on to Partner Connect, another one that would just make it easier to work with it. Uh, Undrop Table is this another thing for managed Unity Catalog tables. So if you drop a table in Unity Catalog, or normally if you drop a managed table, your data is deleted. And that was my big fear about why would I want to use managed tables if that basically gives Databricks, makes Databricks the system owner of my data. Well, this is an argument saying essentially if you drop a table now in Unity Catalog, you can then undrop that table for seven days. You've got a seven day moving backup window to go, oh, didn't mean to didn't mean to drop that. Can I just undo that? You've now gone undrop table, which is pretty cool. Gives you some protection, gives you a backup. Obviously, you'll still be paying for data under the hood, but again, just makes it a little bit more protected. Uh, deletion vectors, you can now just auto enable deletion vectors for everything. Again, be a little careful. That does change that Delta uh, protocol, but if you're happy to do it, it is really good. Um, we now have global parameters on uh, a Databricks job. So if I have a Databricks job and that has a bunch of tasks in there, I can set basically a, um, a parameter at that job level that all tasks can then see. So if I want to pass a load of state across a load of different tasks, I can now do that using these parameters at the job level. Really cool. Lots of stuff I can do, especially if I'm doing things like conditional logic. So I can do if else conditions inside Databricks workflows and actually build up some slightly more complicated things. Now, we've heard in some of the Ask Databricks sessions that we're also getting for each loops very soon. And that combination of global variables and within your Databricks job, conditional logic that we can do things based on those global variables, and then a for each loop to go and manage parallelism within it. And we'll be able to do so much more interesting, advanced, um, like sophisticated orchestration using workflows. So it's so close to just having all those interesting bits and pieces I've been waiting for. And then finally, on this side, um, we've got some updates about how you can actually sort of um, manage and configure the security if you're using Databricks SQL Serverless. So if you're looking at just depending on whether you're trying to go through uh, a lot of subnet IDs to try and link things fairly manually, or whether you're using as your private link to go and hook things up, there's some new tools to help you do that. So if you're trying to use serverless, you're trying to get things working in a very secure way, this is what you'll go and have a look at. There's a few things just to help you do in that. So pretty cool. Whoa. Right. That is my grand list of all things on the platform side of things. And we've still got the runtime to go and have a look at. So Databricks runtime 40.1 is now GA. There's lots of things you can do in there. And there's a few things that are like, yeah, okay. And there's a few things that are crazy useful. Crazy useful. So a few bits, array inserts, you can now uh, insert into negative indexes a little bit better. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, Delta V2 checkpoints are enabled by default if you're using liquid clustering. So with liquid clusterings, there's a new uh, format for looking after the checkpoints. That is the, the stuff that happens inside your transaction log um, when you're using Delta. So be a little careful because again, that is a different reader protocol, different writer protocol, could have some compatibility things outside of Databricks, but it's generally the way things are going. So you want to be taking a look at it and seeing how that works. Um, dropping uh, Delta Table features you can now do. So if you had enabled deletion vectors, then you realize, oh, I don't want to do that. You can now drop deletion vectors from a given table and revert the changes that you've made. And then huge, huge piece. You can now stream from Unity Catalog views. So if you have a view that you defined over Delta tables, normally one of the, the patterns we use quite a lot when we're building out lake houses is we land all of our data into a raw table and then we stream from that raw table into our base table or cleanse to table. And even if we're only doing like a daily load, we still do streaming on top of it and we just use trigger available now. So it just catches up, trigger it, it catches up and then it stops. But we didn't tend to do a lot of um, data curation, joining lots of tables together, adding business logic because Honestly, that's really annoying to try and do as a stream because you're having to manage temporal joins and all sorts of nastiness. And you've got a lot of limitations in structured streaming around it. However, if you can just stream from a view as the source of that stream, then you're not actually doing any in-stream joins. That's really powerful. And again, some of the things of looking at um, streaming tables and materialized views help with this story as well. But just the fact that we can now stream directly from a view and use it as a source is... Great. 
So again, data frame equals spark.readstream table and just pass in a view. And as long as that's a unity catalog view, that's going to work. And that is really, really cool. That's again, a massive change that's coming in. Uh, there's a new Apache Pulsar connector. There's a better Snowflake driver. There's a few things in there. And then there's this thing. So SQL session variables are now available. And I know so many SQL people that will be so happy seeing this because it allows them to do all of the horrible things that people actually do inside SQL Server of define a load of variables, do a load of stuff in SQL, reset things back into that variable. That is so common for how people in, certainly in the Microsoft SQL Server world, build all their nasty store procs and have a load of logic baked in there. You can now do that inside your... Um, your SQL scripts, all that kind of temporary variables or session scoped variables that you can now just define in SQL and use to do various different interesting things. So big, big change, lots of stuff you go, you can now do thanks to that change. If you're using the data runtime 14.1, uh, we can pass name parameters into uh, SQL and Python UDFs, so just making the integration with those things a little bit better. Uh, we can partition an order when we're pushing things into uh, functions and just so you almost treat them a bit like window functions, how we're, how we're passing things in. And there's a load of new functions that are now uh, available in the SQL language. Things like from XML and schema of XML. Now, we've had a load of issues in the past when we're trying to ingest XML data and had to pass it into JSON so we can then use a lot of the native um, Spark stuff. Now we can just actually pass XML natively if it's being passed in as a string. And that just opens up loads of integration when you're working with horrible things that are giving you XML. Now, obviously, the right thing to do is not work with those things and work with things that give you JSON, because why are people still using XML? But the sad answer is people still are. It's still around. You're still going to have to use it. And now you can work with that a lot easier in the SQL context, which is just super useful. And again, anything that comes in in the SQL context, you can always just call from PySpark or Scala. So yeah, really, really, really useful how that works. And then finally, uh, some improvements around how it does correlated subqueries. So again, if you've got some advanced um, SQL you're trying to fit in, you're trying to port over a load of SQL from an existing legacy environment, get that working inside Databricks, well, actually, that's going to work a lot better. There's things that were previously limitations around things like correlated subqueries. Now you can just do them a little bit better. Oh. And then obviously the normal library changes, lots of things going on. Huge amount of things going on this month. So the massive, massive change of all of the ML flow artifacts now being Unity catalog backed. That's a big behavior change, but it's great. It's bringing everything together once again. So we're all talking about the same thing. Everything is just Unity catalog control. Massive changes in that runtime. Again, SQL people so happy for variables, so happy for some of those changes going in. Streaming from views challenges so many of our design patterns that we can go, oh, actually, we can just do things differently now. There's just a ton, a ton of stuff. I'm probably forgetting the things that were actually near the start of that gigantic list of things that we went through. There is just that much happening this month. So, yeah, I guess my final thing is go and document your data models because you've got no excuse now. You just need to click a button and check what it says because that's just going to happen automatically now. Please go and document your data models. <sighs> cool. So that is everything I wanted to run through today. I'll put the links for all those things down in the description. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And yeah, if uh, advancing analytics can help you out on your Databricks journey, then don't forget to give us a shout. All right. Cheers.